For those who don't know me, my name is Marilyn Rowe, and I am one of the administrators of the ETC. I would like to introduce our other administrators, Nadine Talek. Nadine, can you stand up, Madonna? Here she is. She already stood up. And Deborah Simmons. Deborah. Our spokesperson, Mr. Daryl Shelley. And our members that we have here tonight, uh, Ms. Shelley Jesso. Brandon Billick is in the house here somewhere. Duran, there you go. Uh, Cherise Benoit, where are you, girl? Okay, not here, okay. Uh, Cyril Tur and Melinda, right there. Lillian Cormier, there she is. Karen Kittner, I know she's back here somewhere. There you go. Doreen Young. Where are you, Doreen? There, there she is, there she is. And other volunteers we have with us as well. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Aiden Young, our cameraman and volunteer. Thank you, Aiden, for this for us. Uh, I would like to acknowledge and welcome our MHA, Mr. Tony Wakeham. On behalf of the Environmental Transparency Committee of Port of Port, I would like to welcome and thank everyone for coming out tonight. A few members of our committee attended a luncheon for the Chamber of Commerce Small Business Week in Stephenville on October 17th. The guest speaker was Sean Leet, who was representing World Energy GH2. And Mr. Logan, liaison for the company, was also in attendance. At that meeting, Sean said that they are willing to come out and meet with the communities, to which I replied, we are having one next week. I will forward an invitation as soon as I get home. I sent an invitation that night with all the details and a couple of days later, Mr. Hogan replied and said none of the stakeholders from the company would be able to meet with us tonight. But they have time for business luncheons. In the 49 page environmental impact study, which also could be called the Watton Report because his Environmental impact studies are always 49 pages. He talks about the distance from wind turbines to receptors. The people of the peninsula are referred to as receptors. So I looked up the definition. A receptor is a region of tissue or a molecule in a cell membrane which responds specifically to a particular neurotransmitter, hormone, antigen, or other substance. I would like to say to Mr. Eric Watton that all of us here this evening are human beings. There is over 4,000 people on the Port of Port Peninsula, and this, sir, is our home. Over the past few months, door-to-door poll Over the past few months, door-to-door -door polls have been conducted in 10 communities on the Port of Port Peninsula and have been done at town halls and community centers. Sheets Cove conducted by the local service district at our community center. The results are, we are 100% against the project. <laughs> the town of Cape St. George Polls conducted at their office in their town hall. Results are on to their website. 76% against the project. Yep. The local service district of Ship Cove, Lower Cove, and Jerry's Nose. Door-to-door -door polls done. The results are 92% against the project. The local service district of Campbell's Creek conducted by door-to-door -door polling. The results are 80% against the project. The town of port of port West, which includes Felix Cove, port of port West, like the Front Road, Father Joy's Road, Agatuna, and Boss Wallace, Conducted by door-to-door -door polls, the results are 53% against the project. Yep. 
the local service district of Piccadilly Slant and Abraham's Cove, done by door-to-door -door polling. The results are 82% against the project. <laughs> the local service district of Piccadilly Head, door-to-door -door polls conducted. The results are 78% against the project. The local service district of Black Duck Brook and Winter Houses, door to doors, door to door polls conducted. The results are 84% against the project. The local service district of Three Rock Cove conducted door to door polls. The results are 96% against the project. The local service district of Mainland conducted door-to-door -door polls. The results are 98% against the water. Based on these 10 communities, we are currently sitting at 84% against this project. A few of our members set up a polling and information table at the Port of Port Fall Fair on October 1st. These are the results from people all over the Bay St. George area. 38 people took part in our poll. 34 people were against the project, 3 people were for it, and 1 undecided. So percentage-wise, that would be 89% against the project on that day. Yes, sir. we will have more results of what we conducted here tonight. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass the podium over to Nadine Talek. I'm so blessed to have all of you here tonight. It just gives me such joy because we worked so hard all summer. We started our committee, the Environmental Transparency, committee on July the 9th after the July the 6th meeting. We had a meeting with Mr. Risley and after that meeting we, there were so many answers that wasn't answered that night and so many concerns. We were just blindsided by this project that came so fast upon us. So many days to respond to a comment for the uh, Minister Davis for July 26th. We were just swamped all summer doing research doing unaccountable meetings among uh, the areas because we did not have no information from our politicians, from our councils, from our MHAs that didn't give us enough information about what was coming and the project and we felt that we had to get out there, do research and get some information for you. We're all volunteers and what information we've got, we have took it from the proposal from the Rural Energy GH2 and a lot of it we did online, did a lot of research. I'd like to thank all my family because I've been not there for anyone this summer but this project. Now we went out there and we collected polls, we did protests, we went to numerous meetings and we're feeling you but tonight I feel you because I worked so hard all summer to get this for you. Your shows that the people of the Port of Port Peninsula was not well informed, we were blindsided, we were not respected, and we are here to let the government and our MH <coughs> know that we are not for the project for reasons that we feel that is not for the Peninsula. Um, we had petitions started right from the beginning when we heard about this project that was going to be approved, not approved, sorry, pr 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 proposed. <laughs> I'm going to get emotional here now. So when we started the propose, the petitions, uh, we, we started off going door to door and a lot of seniors couldn't come tonight, but they did express many concerns to me and they say, why here, why port of port This peninsula is so beautiful. We have so many rare prestige plants, mountains, and we have rare plants. Why would they come here and take away all the generations that we've been here? We've been here for many years, and how can a company come in here and expect us 
to let them come into our backyard, put a mega wind turbine project up that was never put on land before because these are industrial turbines, guys, and we are the guinea pigs here. And it was so, so emotional that, I mean, like I said, we went around door to door, got petitions, and in the first few weeks we had over a thousand petitions. And then I went online and I did a dot org. And I had 406 petitions and even some signed from Germany. Yes, Uncle, <laughs> Germany. <laughs> we are here tonight to let our MHA know how we feel. Please do not he hesitate to come up after and answer any questions. We're going to have a question period after this. But this is not over. We still have a chance. The EIS, the Environmental Impact Statement, is not complete. We are the social license. We are the people. We can say no to this project, and us being here tonight is proving that. Let's keep up the fight. Thank you. again doing this again now <laughs> and like I said the very first time we'll do it again and again and again until the very last one of those workers one of the very last piece of equipment is out of here this is not an optional thing it's not happening in port of port period <laughs> we have to stand up and make that clear to them. So we got to do things within the bounds of the law and within the bounds of our government I still believe in a democratic and fair process. I still believe we have a choice. And that choice is expressed, obviously, in the polls that Maryland presented. It's overwhelming, actually. Very much so. We were at the luncheon, and they said there was 160 people polled in western Newfoundland, and had a bunch of them wanted the Green Energy Project, more than 55%. 160 people out of 35,000. We, we, they've done 160 in almost every community. If there's that many people there, they did, they did at least two-thirds of the communities. You know, they're knocking on every door. So 25 volunteers, I want to give them a round of applause. A lot of work. So I'm going to dive into a little bit about what's going on here and who John Reesley really is. On August 1st, the ETC called a meeting here in this room. Chief Brendan Mitchell attended that meeting. You can find recordings of that meeting online. Our intention at the time was to ask the government to force the company into completing an environmental impact study for the project. The government did agree and was supposed to release the requirements of that study in December of this year. However, on September 29th, we learned that the government had released a 49-page guideline to the proponent three months ahead of schedule. The EIS only focused on the Port of Port Peninsula, site B and C, Lewis Hills, Blow Me Down, and Bay St. George South were not included. And on October 19th, MHA Eddie Joyce submitted a petition asking the government to delay the EIS until the three sites were included. No reason was given for this rushed approach or the splitting of the assessment. Eddie Joyce was the first MHA to present a petition in the House, and today, uh, at the end of this meeting, we're going to present a petition to Tony Wakeham as well. We have an A-tip that shows John Risley was communicating with the provincial government about an offshore wind energy project to CFFI Ventures back in January 2022, while the wind moratorium was still in place in the province, and Sakama Measle Joe from Con River also signed those letters at that time. Since then, I believe they pulled out, but the locals and the band members had no idea what was going on at that time. And at that time when the discussion was around offshore wind farm in the ATIP, we discovered that Risley was, uh, was made aware that the offshore areas were to fall under the jurisdiction of the Canada Newfoundland Labrador Offshore Energy Board, formerly known as the Canadian and Newfoundland Labrador Offshore Petroleum Board, who managed claims in the area. The company soon switched their proposal from offshore to onshore development without notifying anybody here. And furthermore, there were letters signed by various mayors and community leaders long before the public was made aware of the project. Then there's Fury and Risley's fishing trip. I'm sure you heard about that one. Oh, yeah. On October 19, businesses and political insider website, All Newfoundland Labrador reported that Premier Andrew Fury spent four days on a fishing trip in Labrador. He, he stayed at John Reesley's luxurious Rifflin Hitch Lodge, a lodge previously owned by Liberal MP, our Liberal MP, Goody Hutchings. The lodge usually costs approximately $75,000 for a four night stay for a group of eight. Fury insists that he paid for the trip himself, but has yet to produce receipts as requested by the PC opposition. 
What we do on our own time and our own dime should be respected, said Andrew Fury. The Liberals seemed concerned on October 19 when PC House Leader began speaking about this fishing trip in the House of its Assembly, and you could be heard from the opposite side of the room, Barry, Barry, you want to get personal? It's coming. It's coming this ap afternoon, Liberal MP, or Liberal MHA Crocker yelled across the floor from the legislature after Petten had asked a question about Fury's trip. What are they so afraid of? Really? What the Premier does on his own time and dime is the business of the people of this province. The Premier holds the highest position in the province and works for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador 365 days a year. Should he have time to relax? Sure, of course he can. Should that be on, uh, on his downtime at a, a cottage in a fishing trip with a billionaire buddy of his father's in secret? A billionaire who conveniently, conveniently is now proposing one of the largest wind turbine projects in North America, starting on the Port of Port Peninsula? No, he should not. It's absolutely ridiculous that the public had to find out about this through an investigative journalism almost a year and a half after it had taken place. Here, here. Yeah. I'm going to break down a little bit for the record. And this is from Ed Hollett. The timeline of events. December 2020, Government of Canada announces a renewable energy project with major focus on wind. May 2021, Moya Green Report recommends province invest oil revenue into green technology using a future fund. July 2021, Premier Andrew Fury and John Reesley go fishing at Reesley's camp in Labrador. We don't find out about it until October 2022. September, October 2021, Government of Newfoundland starts to develop wind energy policy at the same time as its development and renewable uh, energy policy. September 2021, Brendan Paddock, appointed to head Churchill uh, River Advisory Group, suppressed under order in council, uncovered by news media, in June 2022. November 2021, Risley and Fury attended COP26 in Glasgow. Remember that one? We had to pay for that one too, with $50,000 out of the coffers. Risley attended with one of his companies, and Fury went as part of a Canadian delegation. Not telling me they never had a little chat about wind energy at least once? Quite a coincidence. Government Newfoundland, December 2021, announces renewable energy plan. March 2022, Brendan Paddock arranges two meetings from mid-April, one for himself at the Premier, Energy, and, and another one with Andrew Parsons and staff, and another one with Reasley, Fury, and Parsons and staff from an ATIP request. That's before they lifted the ban. Then they lifted the ban April 5th. Cabinet approves amendment of 2006 order in council banning wind energy development. And also in a minis uh, ministerial statement, Parsons announces the end of wind development ban, no news conference. He incorrectly refers to it as a moratorium, as a temporary halt, because there's been a complete ban since 2006. Parsons had no details about the process, the time saying it was all under development. Yeah, we can trace that back from the year before that. Mm -hmm. Risley meets the Premier and other officials in May to April, presumably talking about the hydrogen project, while the Premier claims there are no procedures in place to prevent him from having meetings like this. No one has denied this meeting was not about the wind project. Mm -hmm. All Newfoundland and Labrador, June 14th, story suppressed. Orders in Council, eight tip responses. June 15th, all Newfoundland and Labrador and opposition reaction, June 14th, sorry. Premier's office issues statement that people knew about the missing uh, orders in council in the ATIP because the government told them. June 2022, Risley and Paddock, Stephenville registered environmental uh, uh, review. Ju July 2022, after concerns raised publicly about Paddock and Risley relationship, government changes rules on crown land acquisition for wind development. Media event is billed as an update on the policy. August 2022, minister requires environmental assessment for Risley Paddock, Stephenville project. August 2022, federal uh, uh, agreement with Germany on hydrogen steam mill, big meeting with Trudeau, Fury meets with Risley and other potential proponents for wind energy projects in steam mill. And this happened despite Fury's insistence before and after the meeting that he's still not involved in any decisions in the wind hydrogen policy. <laughs> October 2022, all Newfoundland and Lambert, this goes on, boys. Right? This goes on, right? And then finally, October, we get the expression of interest land pers uh, expression of interest in land parcel lands. So I mean, this goes on and on. I mean, this is you know right? yeah. silly, preposterous. So who's John Reesley? Well, the bio that I found online on their website says that John Reesley has an estimated one billion dollars. He's the chairman and CEO of CFI Ventures, a diversified holding company operating internationally. The company has majority or significant stakes in a portfolio of young companies ranging from financial services, renewable energy, tech sector. He's also the chair of the Northern Private Capital, a Toronto-based fund which invests in high growth opportunities. He's the chair of MDA Corporation, Canada's iconic spa, uh, space company. Mr. Reesley's active in community affairs. He sits on the board of a number of charitable organizations. Sounds like a nice guy, right? 
Here's what you don't know. According to the Halifax Examiner, I don't even think Tony would know this one. Maybe he does, but according to the Halifax Examiner, Reasley has made a decent career of lobbying Nova Scotian government for funding. Here's only some of the highlights, starting in 1998. But he had gone back before that, but I'll start in 1998 because that's when the numbers get big. 1998, $1 million, unconditionally repayable contribution to undertake marketing services related to sea lutions, S-E-A lutions. 2001, $6 million, a conditionally regrettable contribution to micro-encapsulation for omega-3 functional foods. 2006, $2.9 million, a conventionally repayable contribution for microbial production of high-value omega-3 oil concentrates. 2010, $3 million, a conditionally repayable contribution for commercialization of biofuel from microbiology. Let's move on to Risley's Clearwater Seafood Limited Partnership. Here's how much the province of Nova Scotia, taxpayers of Nova Scotia, has paid over the years. 2009, $6.9 million, Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture. $12.5 million, Department of Agriculture. The next year, $7.2 million, Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture. 2011, 231000 Department of Environment. $11.8 million, Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture. 2012, $45.5 million, Development of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. And here's some of the money that he got from the Atlantic Canadian Opposition Agency, ACOA. $18.7 million non-payable contribution in 2012 to hire a consultant to identify improvements in, pro in processes at Lackport location. And $57 million in 2009 from the provincial and federal government. $15 million from Clearwater's home province of Nova Scotia and the rest from the feds. That's $170 million and more that he lobbied from taxpayers in Nova Scotia. And now he's over here, yeah. Yeah. hanging out in cottages and having fishing chips, trips. He's over here to give it to Mike Nova Scotia. <laughs> That's only some of the money that we know about. That's not all of it. There's certainly more we can't find online or we don't know about. So my question is this. Since John Reesley seems to have made a career to lobbying Nova Scotian government for taxpayers' dollars, and since he seems to be good friends with Andrew Fury and his family, who's coming up with the other $11 billion for this project? Newfoundland and Labrador does not have any money to lend out to John Reeslake, and we do not want another Muskrat Falls. There was also another the elephant in the room that nobody's mentioned, and that is the Company Approved Committee. You guys might have heard about this. This is a public notice from the Port of Port East website in July. A wind turbine committee formed by 18 people of the Port of Port region came together to discuss the concerns and the issues of the comments made by community leaders. As promised, the company World Energy GH2 took 10 committee members and they flew them up to uh, Grand Nouveau Wind Farm in Hamilton, Ontario to experience firsthand what it was like to hear a wind farm. A lot of questions were answered in regards to some of the issues were raised. Uh, some questions still remain, and as a regional group, our goal, this is, their, this is what they said, our goal is to ensure that we do our very best to address all issues and concerns to everybody's questions to the best of our ability. There's very, very little release since then. They, the members of this so-called Port of Port Wind Turbine Committee have been distant. There's been no engagement uh, between them and the communities in the peninsula. The ladies have actually had to go to some of these town halls and speak to these people directly. And we asked for a meeting with them, and they said that the, they can't, sh they can't, couldn't have a meeting with us because they didn't have enough information to share with us. <laughs> there you go. And they're under a gag order because if they speak out against the company, they'll get zero dollars. So yep. they're, they have a gag order. Yep, they were, they were promised the money before the project's even been considered for environmental assessment, right? Yep. So, also the day before the Trudeau visit to Stephenville. In uh, August 23rd, the committee was invited to a private fancy dinner at World Energy GH2's expense in Rizzoli's. That's only the one dinner we know about. There probably were other interactions. So it looks to us like World Energy GH2 is meeting and talking with community leaders without the knowledge of the public. The town of Stephenville, some of you might not know this one, spent $26,500 to send four delegates to a wind conference in Hamburg at the end of last month, right before Hurricane Fiona approached our shores. And the purpose was to sign MOUs with the town of Stephenville and the Halipu. $26,500 for four people who have no understanding or expertise in wind energy to go to Hamburg, Germany. And after their air fare, worked out to something like six, seven hundred bucks spending money each day. Wine and dine. Why? That's the taxpayer's money. That's our money too. So why was it necessary to send four delegates? Would it not have been sufficient to send one person? 
And why are town leaders spending taxpayers' dollars on a project that's still in the environmental assessment stage? That's right. Are getting guaranteed to get their money back, or are they just spending our money so that they can go out and party? I don't understand. That's right. So in early July, John Reasley had a meeting with residents. You guys remember that meeting? Yeah. Quotes from some of the quotes from John Reasley from some of the some of the things he said. I just want to read them off to you. This is deleted by YouTube, by the way. A day or two after it was released, this man right here managed to save a copy and get it up on Rumble. doing that sir and then the CBC even themselves in the article the, the the video was deleted it wasn't the CBC's fault they embedded it from YouTube but somebody from Reasley's camp went out and got that removed from YouTube so these are the kind of people we're dealing with right because why because he said things he wasn't supposed to say well look at the drones and the helicopters and everything else that yeah. we had to put up with all summer so right? some of the things he said if you don't want it or if you want to change it to something else we will listen to you where is he? Where's the, where's the company? They're not listening to me. Are you listening to anybody you guys? Or? No, they think so. Does the government want the project to proceed? Yes, they want the project to proceed. Exact quote. This is, this is in July. He knows the government wants it to proceed. Is the government making a decision here? Or is John Reasley running our, our, our province? Right. John Reasley is running the province. He's running whatever he wants, right? So he's pretty confident from whatever was said in that fishing trip. <laughs> Where people say collectively we decided we don't want any wind farms on the Port of Port Peninsula, if that is a unanimous decision, the people of Port of Port Peninsula, we will move away. Well, unanimous is pretty impossible, but I think we've got a pretty sizable chunk of the people who don't want it. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Provincial and federal governments are anxious to see this happen. Federal, he said. Provincial and federal governments are anxious to see this happen. What I see is a big, a giant embarrassment to the Fury and uh, Trudeau government. Unless they already had a deal we didn't know about, and Risley's either telling the truth or he's lying. 120 meters tall, he said that's the max our wind engineer. He said no more than that. They're double that, right? Double that. Huge. Government is going to lease the Crown lands to us and they're going to charge us. And then there's, that's been uh, changed apparently. So who exactly are we dealing with? This will be my last point. You might want to go to the Halifax Examiner and search John Reasley's South African adventure in 2006. John Reasley, Canadian billionaire, inherited the CIEX, which is a UK firm's contract to purchase re uh, claims related to an ap apartheid era economic crime. Apartheid is a name given by the white ruled South Africa's, na uh, the African's name given uh, by the white ruled South Africa's Nationalist Party in 1948 the country's harsh institutionalized system of racial segregation which came to an end in the 1990s in a series of steps that led to a formation of a democratic government in South Africa in 1994. Risley came on board as a kind of a venture capitalist agreeing to fund Jorge Pinhall's case and legal team in exchange for profiting any victory which as outlined above would result in a substantial monetary payout. Risley's team of lawyers launched litigation against KBC Bank and Arms Corps in Belgium and Portugal respectively on behalf of Portuguese arms dealer and sanctions buster Jorge Pinhall. The litigation seeks a payment of up to 4 billion rand from Arms Corps, Armaments Corporation of South Africa, Arms Procurement Agency of South Africa Department of Defense. Jorge Pinhall claims that he was cheated, helicopters were delivered. Pinhall says that he was never paid the 10% facilitation fee by Arms Corps. The deal was ultimately worth around $3 billion. So Pinhall at various times in the past 25 years has claimed up to $300 million for his role in busting the UN's arms embargo. So his legal team was funded by Reasley. That's all I'm going to say about that. But I'd like for anybody out in the community who's listening, who's supporting this project, any mayor, councillor, anybody else. They're not here tonight. I, they're not here tonight, but I would like for you to do some research to find out who you're actually dealing with. Thank you. How's everyone doing? Uh, before I start, I just want to make sure, uh, is there anybody from the Council of Cape St. George here tonight? Good, so I want to know. Didn't ex I didn't expect anyone. Okay, um, we've been hearing a lot of going on about, you know, money that's being thrown around. People are getting excited over $10 million, okay? So when they announced the Vibrancy Fund, I decided to do a little bit of research. Went online and I accessed all the, uh, the voting, registered voters, for all of Newfoundland. And based on the communities that they've identified that would share in this money, I went around and did a little bit of math. 
So right now, with all the communities involved, you're looking at 12,828 registered voters. That's not including children or anything like that. That's just people that vote. So if you divide that into $10 million, you're getting $779.54 per person up front. <laughs> However, if you take the $779.54, further divided by 25 years, which is the proposed length of the project, you're looking at a total of $31.18 per voter over that 25 year period. That's per year. You divide that again by the months, and each person's head is worth $2.60. And that's all the money that's been proposed to be put forward. And now that's, of course, going to be paid over three years, but you have to keep in mind that the project will be running for 20 to 25 years. So that's what everybody's worth right now is not even a coffee and a tin bit. <laughs> okay, so the amount that, that GH2 is proposing comes out to 0.008%, while in other places in Canada, the revenue paid out is between 1 and 3%. So like in Quebec, uh, they will charge upwards of $4,149 annually for a 2.5 megawatt windmill that is on Crown Land. So, if you take the project that's going on here, one gigawatt facilities are looking at, and 164 windmills, which would have to put out a minimum of six megawatts. So if we use the same modeling technique as Quebec is using, they're one of the lower range ones, um, we'd be looking at around $12,000 per turbine on the peninsula. But just to bring it back down to perspective, I'll just put it at the 2.5 megawatts that Quebec uses, and if we did that, and we take in consideration that down the road they want to have a total of 500 windmills, we're looking at almost $2.1 million in royalties a year just for having the windmills on the land. Now, if we multiply that by the wattage, you can pretty well triple that. It's just a clip. And well, that would be for the port port <coughs> and once they extend the, the rest of it. Now, one thing they haven't discussed is, and we've asked several times over the uh, months, we've proposed a lot of questions, and all we hear is crickets from GH2. And one of the biggest concerns is infrasound. Now, infrasound is created by windmills as they spin. And infrasound, you, you can't hear, it's at 20 hertz, it's the hearing level of humans. However, to put it into perspective, um, for those that have listened to loud music, you know, going to the dances when you were younger, and you hear the bass and somebody really cranks it, you can feel it bouncing through your chest, and some people get, you know, anxiety or whatnot from it. Um, that's what we're looking at, is that lower frequency range. Now, these frequencies can travel for up to several hundred miles. It'll penetrate mountains, it'll penetrate walls, it'll penetrate almost anything. It's a lower frequency. You can't hear it, but your body will feel it. And it's not just humans that will feel it. It'll affect moles, cows, prey mantas, moths, pigeons, everything that's out there. So, water as well. Yes. And uh, as a matter of fact, that frequency range is used for communicating with submarines underwater. So, for other creatures that can't hear it, even though you can't hear it, you can feel it. And so reports, reported effects include those on the inner ear, vertigo, imbalance, etc., intolerable sensations, incapacitation, disorientation, nausea, vomiting, and bowel spasms, and a resonance in the inner organs such as the heart. So that's what I was speaking about, is the, vibra is the vibrations you'll feel within your body. Now these, this research has been done through different medical journals and I've just compiled a little bit of this and there's a lot more if people decide they want to go online and, and look for it. Uh, many animal tests have found infrasound to effectively, sorry, to negatively affect the heart, liver, nervous system and the lungs. However, it's still not known to what extent these negative effects would have over prolonged exposure. These were just controlled uh, studies that were done over short durations of time. 
People who live or work in close proximity with turbines have experienced symptoms that include decreased quality of life, annoyance, stress, sleep disturbance, headache, anxiety, depression, and con cognitive dysfunction. So, and the interesting thing about this is that you have some film, movie soundtracks that will make use of infrasound to induce anxiety and unease and disorientation in the audience. They will put out that lower frequency. So as it goes through your body, it will cause that anxiety. And two such movies are irreversible and paranormal activity. And so that's why sometimes when you watch a movie, certain movies, you'll, you'll, you'll get really anxious and stuff. It's not because the movie is scary. It's because there's a lower frequency to pump in there that creates that. Getting on to weather. Around here, as you all notice, you all came in. You've seen the clouds are hovering just above the mountains that we have here. That's where the majority of our rain comes from. Cumulus clouds, which form at around 1,000 feet to 7,000 feet. So you're looking at turbines that are going to be up an extra 600 and something feet. And there is a photo that I put out front uh, that shows off the coast of Denmark where the actual uh, studies have shown that windmills can adversely affect the local climate. It can increase the ground temperatures and can also affect, if it's up high enough, the formation of clouds and affect your rain patterns. So you have to consider that apart from tearing up all the land that they'd be doing, tearing up all the vegetation and affecting the water absorption, you're looking at secondaries, well what exactly is going to happen to our rainfall? Not going to be good. No. And the final thing I want to point out is this is something I brought up with the reps from GH2 and even during the business lunch we had on Monday. Inflation. Majority of people around the area are on fixed income. And a lot of people can ill afford to pay for the necessities and decent food to put on their tables with the prices the way they are now. When I brought this forth, I asked, I said, okay, your company is going to be coming in. You have billions to spend against locals who have limited finances. There's going to be demand on lumber, all the building materials, gas, diesel. There's going to be a demand on food. Housing. And right now, the supply chain, as everybody knows, you go in town, you're lucky sometimes to see full shelves. You want to order something from the stores, uh, you have to wait months to get things because the supply chain is in such disarray. Response I had gotten, one of two. The first response was, from one of the reps, I won't say a name, was specifically that with the money that people will be making working at the site, they would not mind paying $40 for a can of Coke. And when I proposed the same question at the meeting at the uh, uh, the meeting in Stevenville, um, I was essentially told that well, that's something we, sh we should you discuss with the mayor of Stevenville with the supply chain. So I, essentially, the company is just wiping their hands of any responsibility for any future. Um, increases in cost of living. Uh, I, myself and Anne Marie have been looking at plans of building a new house and we've even had a local contractor come in. Gave us a rough estimate for a sewer system and when we announced we we're going to put down a cement slab we we're told good luck because all the cement is earmarked for the project and no cement company is going to waste their time with small projects such as that. And so everything is going to be going up that's if you can get it. If you can get it, if you can afford it. Like I said, the company has billions they can throw at this. So they, like I said, they don't mind spending a couple of hundred bucks on something that would normally cost a few cents. When we were doing the polls in Port Port, um, we went to this uh, house and there was a house next door to us that was for sale. And it was in the process of being sold. And once the people that wanted to buy the house said there was going to be windmills, they, they heard about the windmills in Port Port, backed out on that deal. So that house is not for sale now. So they backed out that deal. So you think we're going to actually sell our homes here on a peninsula if we had no choice? The answer is no. Devalued. Devalued. And the, 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 the values will go up in the steamboat. 
Yeah, that's about it. Well, that's because everybody from around here had to move down there to get away from the noise. Yeah. Um, and one thing to remember, people, this company is what well, they hate it when I refer to them and such. They are a virgin company. They only formed in June. They have never done a project like this before. They have zero experience. And they're using turbines that were designed for offshore for onshore use. So they don't even know what the effects of that are going to be. And we have posed many questions along those lines. And like I said before, we have not received any substantial answers from them other than generic replies. We'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. You know, simple answers like that. And when you take into consideration the amount of roadway that they'll be putting up in the back, 120 <coughs> kilometers of road, they were saying it'll be upwards of 19 meters wide. So if you sit back and take that into consideration, you're looking at something that would be equal to almost a four-lane highway from the Cape to Cornerbrook. And that's what will be etched throughout the land back here. So there's a lot of things to consider. Um, I know they've been pushing up their training program. That's just the road. That's just the road. Just the road. Are we running out of time? We're still good. Uh, well, um, okay, just one more thing. Uh, they've been touting their training program, how they've uh, set, you know, they set up at the local colleges and stuff for technical training and, and that so they can get locals to be employed. They want to bring people back home. Immigrants. Yeah. Well, they want to bring people back home, people that have moved away. And as much as the training program, this is a great idea. However, their first course is not slated to run until September of 23, 2023. That being said, uh, before you can run a course such as that, in my experience, you had to run a pilot course, which is something I would mentioned to the reps. And when you run a pilot course, that's just to make sure you have the proper training for all your people. So the course, they said, will take about a year. So that pilot course, essentially, once it's done, well, the people really aren't qualified, and so they have to run an actual proper course, which would start in 2024. The first graduates would be in 2025. Well, the project's already going to be well underway then, according to the company, right? Mm -hmm. And what company in their right mind is going to hire students fresh out of training to work on a project that the company has no experience on themselves? So at the end of it, you're going to be left with trained people, locals probably, with nowhere to work. And when I brought this up with Mr. Hogan, his response was, well, once their training is done, they have the qualifications to go anywhere in the world they choose to work. <laughs> so that kind of reverses their philosophy of bringing people home. So that's all I have to say for now. Uh, anybody? Okay, I'm going to invite Mr. Wake up front and Daryl. The shadow, shadow guy. I guess I'll be the one presenting this to Tony. But um, back to what Duran was saying there. If you, when I came down here today, I got stuck behind a slow car. You know what it's like when you get stuck behind a slow car. There's gonna be a lot of slow moving cars when they're putting those 200 meter turbines in here. I can guarantee you that. It's gonna take you a very long time to get your groceries if you gonna leave here and go all the way up there and back with the construction on those roads. I tell you. So. We would like for um, Tony Wakem to submit a petition in the House of Assembly on the behalf of the residents here, and the petition reads as follows. On June 21st, 2022, an undertaking was registered by World Energy GH2 called Project Neodronic. The proponent is proposing to construct and operate a maximum one gigawatt, 164 turbine off, uh, onshore wind farm in port of port Peninsula with the associated transmission and supporting infrastructure to power a 0.5 gigawatt hydrogen ammonia production facility in the port of Stephenville. Whereas, the people of port of port Peninsula have been asked and polled and show an overwhelming percentage to be against this project. Whereas, as John Reesley himself told the people of the port of port Peninsula on July 6, 2022, <coughs> that he would respect the collective decision of the public. Whereas, proposed vibrancy fund is less than the industry standard and therefore insufficient. Whereas, the environmental impact statement requirements have been rushed to the proponent ahead of schedule. Whereas, an ATIP shows lobbying from John Reesley starting in January 2022 before the ban on wind energy was lifted in the province. And, whereas,
says, as the personal relationship between Premier Andrew Fury and the company director John Reesley is highly suspect and leads to a possible conflict of interest, therefore, we the undersigned call upon the House of Assembly to urge the government of Newfoundland and Labrador to immediately stop the wind project and hydrogen project known as World Energy Neodronic GH2. Yeah. to uh, commend the committee and the organizers for uh, for doing this and uh, for the excellent turnout here tonight to all of you for coming out. The only thing I would say before I start is do not allow this company or any other company to tear the Port of Port Peninsula apart. I know there's lots of people who may support this project for other reasons or are looking for more information, but these are your neighbors, these are your friends. Do not allow this company or any other company to tear you apart like that between your neighbors. I think we all want the same thing. You all want the same thing. You want what's best for the Port of Port Peninsula, and that's what everyone wants. So let's not allow anybody to tear us apart. I wanted to tell you also that I have a petition in my desk in the House of Assembly right now. I think it has a thousand signatures on it. Okay, and my yes, colleague yes. Eddie gave me. Yes, yes. And I would have presented it in the House last week except my dad passed and I wasn't in the house last week. Sorry, no, no, that's no problem. He had a great life. But I will present it this week when I go back. And I will take this one as well. I may have to change some of the little wording here. I'm not sure that I'll get it past the clerk. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's, not, try, that's, not, that's not a problem. I would gladly, I gladly do that. You know, all of us in, in Newfoundland and Labrador are very proud of where we live and we've lived. I mean, and when I think about some of the comments that were made earlier about our resources and everything, and you go back to 1949, if you want, when we joined Confederation, and you think about what we brought to Canada. I mean, the largest, best fishing grounds in the world. We're, all, we're in Newfoundland, we're a part of that. Uh, when you think about our forestry industry, and our mining industry, and now we've got our oil industry, and all of those industries that we have one would think, and a lady made a comment over here earlier this evening, one would think we'd be getting a royalty check by now, and uh, instead we find ourselves as a problem literally haven't got a dollar to our name. Because we've allowed companies for too long to come in here and to turn around and take our resources, and we're not the ones who are benefit, benefiting from them. The Upper Churchill contract. we'll start to get some of that back but you know we have a history of companies coming in people coming in and taking government money and as long as the government money is there they're here and as soon as the government money runs out they're gone with the wind I mean you've got buildings around everywhere in this province just like that so fundamental principle that I stand for and I our party stands for is that the the physical resources, the natural resources of Newfoundland and Labrador belong to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. And the principal beneficiary of, of those resources has to be the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. Here, here. And, you know, there's the work that's been done here and the questions that are being asked are legitimate questions and they deserve answers. And that's part of what they have asked for. You know, some of the comments I've heard tonight are, are irresponsible on behalf of a company to respond with that. People have legitimate concerns. They deserve to have their, their concerns answered. Now, we may not always agree on the answer, but we need to have that respect, and we need to understand what it is we're asking. So this so-called guidelines is draft. They, we can make comments until November 8, and I think that's what the committee plans to do. So what's not included in the environmental assessment process will be added. And Darrell spoke about the $10 million. I mean, it is. It's peanuts. You spoke Great about crumbs. it. It's, it's, it's not. No, it's a bribe. Our government, our government had better understand that the province of Newfoundland and Labrador is not for sale. We already heard they spent five million dollars on called the Rothschild report which they refuse to let anybody know what's in it or what they're planning on selling off so if we're going to have a project 
if they're going to want to push things ahead, well, the first thing is it has to minimize the uh, impacts and it has to maximize the benefits. Exactly. And that has to be the fundamental principles we stand on and we will not allow anything else. And I can't sit down without getting a little dig in at the uh, Premier and his relationships <laughs> and his challenges because uh, last week in the House of Assembly we raised that and we were almost uh, attacked. attacked because they felt somehow or other the Premier was above us. And I know one of the CBC reporters mentioned and talked about the fact that, you know, the Premier felt like he was doing us a favor by being Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador. Somehow or other he was doing us a favor. I suggest he do us a favor and resign. Yeah. But I will take, gladly take the position this petition into the House. I do not uh, want to take up any more of your time. I'm glad I was able to be here and I'm glad to see such a wonderful turnout for all the hard work that's been done. Thank you. I would like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, we have sandwiches and uh, all kinds of goodies, uh, but if anybody has any questions for our committee or Mr. Wakeham, uh, there is a a uh, wireless mic and uh, our mic operator, Lillian Cormier, will go around if anybody has any questions or comments. Any, any takers? I don't think we set up the mic this time. Don't set up the mic? No. No, we didn't set up the mic. Well, you guys can, we can stand up and other. speak if you want to talk. Perfect. Awesome. Anybody? Okay. Here we go. Back in the room. Hi, Cherise. This is uh, the chair of the local service district of Mainland representing. Uh, I was supposed to be at a different meeting tonight, the meeting of the Port of Port Turbine Committee. I decided that I wanted to bring my concerns here to Mr. Tony Wakeham to make sure that the concerns of our community were being addressed. Mr. Dwight Cornick, who was appointed by the Local Service District of Mainland, was going to participate in this meeting via Zoom. Unfortunately, the Port of Port Turbine Committee, although we decided in a meeting before that this would be allowed, Zoom, via Zoom, they decided tonight, without us being there, that this will not be allowed. So therefore, our community is not being represented tonight. One of the items on the agenda is the Construction Vibrancy Fund. I was told at the last meeting that because my community had a poll of 99% against the project, I should not have been there at that meeting. Oh. Oh my God. By the, oh. by the vice chair and I told him the reason I was there was to bring the concerns that I had from our community and that is why this turbine committee the reason it should have been there not just for the financial benefits that we think we're going to get from this company I will just read some of my concerns now that we have as a community. As you know, I have been introduced as a chairperson of the local service district of Mainland. Mm -hmm. Residents of Mainland are very concerned with the vast number of turbines slated for our community, especially those designated to be constructed near our water supply. Mm -hmm. Being told by representatives of World Energy GH2, namely John Hogan, that there is a strong possibility that our water supply will be impacted is very concerning. This water supply system has cost taxpayers millions of dollars to construct and our community thousands of dollars to finance. If this project gets government approval, it is a great possibility that our water supply will be contaminated or lost during the construction phase due to the proximity of turbines around our watershed area. 
How can the government approve a project that could be devastating to a community's water source? Those in support of the proposed wind farm often make remarks that our community needs new life and opportunities in order to prosper. We, however, are of the opinion that our francophone communities are thriving. Mm -hmm. Three Woo! new businesses. started in our community this year alone and these businesses along with those existing have the potential of employing 35 to 50 people wow. within the next four years. Wow. Community owned businesses such as Tea by the Sea, La Boutique de Ma Grand Mère and Sisters Dream School Museum bring revenue to our community. Next year, a community heritage house and two cabins are slated to open, which will bring even more revenue to our community. Similar feats are being accomplished by a large-scale greenhouse, which will soon be expanding, and for the various entities and organizations working diligently to continue to promote and preserve our culture. Community-owned nonprofit businesses bring tourists to our area, which results in employment opportunities for those in mainland and surrounding areas. How will these community-owned and privately-owned businesses survive the construction phase? The proposed dollars, which will be lost, especially during the construction period, will... Sorry. <laughs> the proposed vibrancy fund from World Energy GH2 certainly won't make up for the tourism dollars which will be lost, especially during the construction period. Our community has worked hard over the years to preserve our francophone heritage and culture. What will happen to our francophone culture if more people start leaving the peninsula and will this project deter former francophone residents from returning to the peninsula and our children and grandchildren from staying here once they start a life on their own. <coughs> Will we lose our francophone heritage which we worked so hard to preserve? If any good has come out of this proposed wind farm, it is witnessing communities join together for the greater good of the peninsula and further symbolizing that communities on this peninsula are far from dying. Yay. Yay. with utmost respect to take our concerns to the house. We also ask you to do everything within your power to stop the billionaire behind this project from manipulating the public with half answers and promises of employment and royalty payments. Thank you for listening. Thank you.